Live from AZTV's Phoenix location in the London Center, it's the Pat McMahon Show. It's true. We made it all the way to Wednesday together. I'm happy. I hope you're pleased. I know you will be. Because I'm going to be talking to you about Israel. I'm going to be talking to you about Sedona. Uh, and uh, you have no idea how many parts of Arizona look like Israel and, and vice versa. It's really remarkable. We're going to be talking about Israel from somebody who has very strong feelings about everything going on in the Middle East politically, economically, militarily and he's going to be here to talk to you about that and his book The Future of Israel uh, really, uh, really intriguing cover that you won't forget and we'll be talking about what actually the cover is all about and what's between the front and the back cover too with our first guest It's interesting, a couple of people said that they thought that it was the Wizard of Oz family movie on a Sunday that interrupted the Raiders and the Jets. In fact, Jerry Mills knew, and Jerry, congratulations to you. Apparently you're already on the east side, so it won't take you very long to get over to Gilbert for all of the activities going on. You've got a dance, you've got a dinner, you've got the rodeo, all kinds of stuff, because you knew it was the famous Heidi interruption that went on. That was in 1968. You weren't even in Israel then, were you? No, I arrived in 1973, just before the Yom Kippur War. What a great time. <laughs> well, it was I mean, <laughs> did your travel agent really uh, talk to you about the possibility of these things? I, I actually didn't go as a tourist. I uh, went to live there. I um, had never been there before, but I uh, became a Zionist through reading, and I emigrated there, so it was a very exciting time, I'll say that. This is Devin Spear, who is the author of The Future of Israel and um, defines Zionist. It's, it's amazing to me how many different interpretations there are of that word. Well, it's not hard to define. Uh, Zion is a synonym for the land of Israel, and so Zionism is Jewish nationalism. And, of course, some people call it fanaticism. They say, oh, listen, those Zionists for crying out loud, they're out of their minds. Well, uh, you can have fanatic Zionists, as you can have uh, fanatic American nationalists, as you can have any sort of fanatic. But to define Jewish nationalism in general as fanaticism is to negate the right of the Jewish people to their own nation in the way that any other people has a right to a nation. Let me, uh, let me do a Reader's Digest condensation here, because I thought that the dedication of this was, um, was very telling. And I have a question about it. The dedication of the book says it's dedicated to the people of Israel. They pay the highest taxes in the world and serve the longest military service. They struggle, they live, and they die for the greatest cause the world has ever known. The greatest cause the world has ever known. Uh, is that uh, high-blown rhetoric? We all have great causes. Uh, no, I believe the cause of Israel, and by Israel, by the way, Pat, I mean the nation of Israel, what we call in Hebrew, Am Israel, and not the state of Israel alone. So it's a synonym for the Jewish people. And the cause of the Jewish people is to bring the idea of God to the world, which is what we have done historically, and to represent God to a world which is not always a moral world. And that is, in my opinion, the greatest cause that the world has ever known. Uh... It seems to some who are critics of Israel, even though they may be supportive of Israel, it seems occasionally that the attitudes of, uh, of Israeli leadership consistently has been um, inflexible, uh, to the point of arrogance. That's it. We have this small country the size of Maricopa County, and we don't give a damn about the rest of the world. We're right. Uh, I would take issue with that. Uh, my point of view in the future of Israel is that the government of Israel has been too flexible. I don't think that uh, the government of the United States, for example, would negotiate away parts of the United States, would negotiate over its capital city, would give away any of the territory of the United States to anyone for any reason. Um, Israel is the only country that has been attacked five times, been the victim of aggression five times, and the victor in five wars that has been asked to give away parts of her territory 
to the aggressor. Isn't that what happened, though, in the United Nations decision to uh, negotiate part of Palestine and make it Israel? Well, there was no nation called Palestine. There was the British Mandate of Palestine, which the United Nations agreed to split into two. One was an Arab section and one was a Jewish section. Uh, the section where the Jews were the majority would become a Jewish state, and the section where the Arabs were a majority would become an Arab state. The Jews accepted that idea. They accepted sharing their land. Um, the problem is, and has been from day one, that the Arabs take a maximalist position. They don't accept the rights of the Jews to have a state of any size. It's not a question of where the border goes. They don't accept the existence of Israel on principle. And that is why this problem has been insoluble until now. But you will acknowledge, though, that uh, a number of governments in the Middle East have, in the last several years, openly acknowledged the right for Israel to exist. And those governments have peace in return. Uh, the, uh, the death of Arafat, what does it mean to Israel? First of all, I think it's a good thing for the entire world. Arafat has been an element for instability and war going back decades. Uh, he is the founder of modern international terrorism. Long before there was an Osama bin Laden, Yasser Arafat uh, killed tens of thousands of people, many more than, uh, than Osama bin Laden has ever killed. Uh, he invented and perfected airline hijacking. He invented and perfected suicide bombing. Um, the problem is this. In 1993, he was given an area, and he was given control over the people in that area, and he was controlling the news media and the school system, and has created a cult of death and martyrdom and hatred there. Uh, young children are brought up um, to aspire as their highest aspiration to be homicide bombers. There are posters of these people on the walls. The little kids go around carrying keychains of what they call the martyrs. That problem isn't going away anytime soon. That mistake, which was giving a terrorist like Arafat a piece of territory to control and pretending he was not a terrorist, that problem is going to cost the world for decades. Well, now that uh, Arafat is gone, I want to find out how you feel about the possibilities of his successors being different, uh, that uh, the existence of a Palestinian state may be on the horizon. And what about uh, President Bush and his personal relationship with Israel? All kinds of things to talk about when you're talking about this dynamic and volatile part of the world, as evidenced by the future of Israel, a book by Devin Spear. We'll talk about the, uh, the contents and also an intriguing cover when we get back. Uh, well, my guest is Devin uh, Spear and the future of Israel, uh, a, a home country to Devin. Uh, for a considerable number of years. Uh, he moved there and has since moved to Arizona. But uh, the book is The Future of Israel. And I mentioned the cover. And Devin, uh, if you will, now fess up. Uh, the minute I saw this and I thought, my, the drama, the drama of the cover of this. And I said, wait a minute, that must be Masada. Because when you go to Israel, many of us have an opportunity to visit this great historic place where... Uh, the Israelites uh, held back uh, their enemies for how long? Three years. It was amazing. I mean, they were on top of uh, this, this, this mountain. But that isn't Masada. Uh, no, um, in that, it is not Masada. That's actually, I believe, a mountain in Arizona. <laughs> Where, where a number of people held back their enemies. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it wasn't, in fact, supposed to be Masada, but it does uh, give that impression immediately to most people. Because you have these warriors on top. And they are, in fact, supposed to be zealots, and since they are the heroes of my story, that's quite all right if people feel that that's Masada. Well, and, and it's a dramatic story. It really is. It's a dramatic story that also uh, somewhat uh, metaphorically creates the mood of an ongoing Israel and and the fact that you have held out against your enemies, whether it's on top of a mountain or with the sea at your back. Uh, yes. Now, there are many Israelis who don't like the image of Masada as a uh, parallel for Israel. Because Why? Because they committed suicide? After all, they committed suicide heroically, but they did die. And victory and not martyrdom should be the objective. What do you think 
that President Bush's objective is in his relationship with Israel today, now going into a second term? Uh, based, we can only base uh, on history on his first term. President Bush is a warm supporter of Israel. He is probably the best president from Israel's point of view in the United States that there's ever been. I personally believe this comes from a deep religious conviction on his part, and I therefore trust it. In other words, this is not a matter of political expediency. Uh, this is a matter of Christian on his part, religious conviction. He loves Israel the way I love Israel, the way many people love Israel. And although I think he's been mistaken here and there in policy, uh, you, you, you have to understand, and I, I think this comes out of love. Why is it that so many evangelical Christian churches who don't necessarily get along with a lot of other Christian churches mm -hmm. have this incredible affection for Israel? Because they're inspired to a large extent by the Old Testament. They go back to the Hebrew Bible for their inspiration. They take it literally. They try not to interpret it in the way that certain churches have uh, allegorically but understand Israel as the Jewish people today. Uh, there is another branch of another view in Christianity which is that the church supersedes Israel uh, once, the, once Jesus was crucified. The evangelical in general, the Protestant point of view is that the Jews are the chosen people of God and they take it the same way as we do. Until the last judgment and then you don't stand a chance in hell. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Meanwhile, I don't think... Oh, is that a Jewish <laughs> attitude? <laughs> I don't think we have too many friends in the world. I think these people are genuine supporters of Israel, and I welcome their support. <laughs> we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Sit down, have a cup of coffee. <laughs> well, there are many Jews who have a problem with that, and that's what I tell them. Should we be in Iraq? I think so. I think that the only hope for peace in the Middle East long term is the democratization of the Arab world. Is it possible? to democratize the Arab world. You know, it's a funny thing. I find myself, as a strong supporter of Israel, uh, supporting the position against many people that the Arabs are people too, and that they want the same things we want, and that they are no less intrinsically uh, deserving of democracy than are we. There is bigotry in Israel, is there not? Well, I was actually referring to attitudes here in the United States. I'm talking about in Israel toward Palestinians, uh, if not in the main, that there certainly is uh, a, a, a strong attitude uh, that is negative toward Arab people, it seems. I don't think so in general. I think if you consider that they have been at Israel's throat and uh, doing horrible things to civilians for a hundred years, this goes back before the existence of the state. The general tolerance shown towards the Arabs in Israel is, uh, has been shown by no one else, including us here in the United States. An Arab can walk down the street with his headdress in Tel Aviv and no one will bother him. He can sit at a cafe and people will serve him politely. No one will do anything to this person because he's an Arab and he enjoys full civil rights and full protection under the law. We did not act that way towards the Japanese when we were at war with them in World War II. And we have to remember Israel is at a state of war. This is not the United States and Canada. And in the real world, and that's the, that's the standard by which Israel needs to be judged, not a utopian standard. In the real world, Israel has behaved towards her enemies uh, much more humanely than certainly they have behaved towards Israel. We've got 875,000 things we can talk about and about a minute to go. So give me a quick response, if you will. Ariel Sharon and his withdrawal from Gaza. Um, I believe the withdrawal from Gaza is much ado about nothing. It's a sign that the government has no real plan. Uh, first of all, it's wrong on so many accounts. Israel is not in Gaza. Israel withdrew from Gaza at the uh, 1993 First Oslo Accord. They control one road along the border with Egypt, which is an, and a small group of settlements that anchor that road at the end. Now, that road is absolutely necessary for them to keep because the Palestinians who today tunnel under that road and bring in weapons would be able to import rocket launchers, surface-to-air missiles, uh, weapons of mass destruction wholesale from Egypt, and there'd be no stopping them. For a self-professed Zionist who lived in Israel and believed strongly, passionately, in its aims, Palestinian state, good? Good, just not on our land. Well, where then? On, uh, the Arabs have all the territory between Morocco and the Persian Gulf. They control a large chunk of the world's resources and land area. Israel is the, one of the smallest countries in the world. 
And I think after a hundred years of trying to compromise over our land, and the Jews have been willing to compromise over their land, and, and I just want to stress that it's their land. It, it doesn't belong to Yas Arafat or Al-Qaeda or Hezbollah or anyone else. Um, but the Jews have recognized that the Arabs have lived there for a long time too, that they have rights in that land, and the Jewish people have been willing to compromise, but after a hundred years of trying to go that route, uh, it hasn't succeeded, and what they need to do is now go in a different direction. I hope you'll come back, because otherwise I've got to get to chapter two. We've only covered <laughs> part of chapter one for The dedication, Allah. I think. Devin Spear, the future of Israel, available at bookstores everywhere, and you can also check out all of the information we've been talking about at that website. Back in just a moment, another part of the world, another desert area, another area of great beauty, the Red Rocks coming up.